Thank you for sharing, Tim. That was really good. Um, let maybe we can turn to Mark 9. I'm going to start by reading a few different passages, and, and then I'll tell you why. <clears throat> uh, Mark 9, I'm going to go to verse 42. And it says, <clears throat> whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The reason I am reading this passage is it seems to bring about really clearly the eternal consequence of sin. It talks about their at the very end there, verse 47 and 48, kind of think makes it even a little clearer. It says, for it's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God rather than being cast into hellfire. So it's kind of like two sides. Kingdom of God, hellfire. Right? What is this hellfire about? It says, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There's a couple other passages I wanted to just briefly read. One is in Matthew 25. Just to see that this isn't just one verse, but there's multiple verses that seem to be implying this eternal consequence. I'm not going to read the whole <clears throat> parable here of the sheep and the goats, but we do know that as Jesus told the parable, he said some of them, the sheep in verse 35, he says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Verse 40. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you did not. You gave me no food. It continues to go on. Verse 45, Then Jesus answering, answered them, saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. So I kind of see these two pictures again. There's the kingdom of God, everlasting life, and one is punishment or eternal Torment. And so we see these two things. And there's, there's more verses on it. It was not just these passages. But the reason I say it is my daughter came home and she'd heard something said that somebody who thinks that God would punish someone eternally is making God out to be a monstrous God. And I, when I heard that, it kind of, I was like, wow. It's quite a thing to say about God monstrous God. I was thinking, what's missing? What's missing? <clears throat> I think it might be actually a common thought from many people in the world to think, I think some of them would even say that it's a common thing they might use to really question or to hinder them from wanting to put, to believe in God is how could God send somebody to eternal judgment or eternal death? They have a tough time understanding that. And I was thinking there's something, there's a few things that are missing. First one, Isaiah, if you turn there, it lets us get a glimpse. This is just an amazing picture, which I think we all need a greater understanding on. Isaiah chapter 6. There's a picture here that we need to understand. <clears throat> it 
It says in verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I was thinking, how could someone come to this place to think that a God who gives an eternal consequence is a monstrous God? I think, number one, they don't understand that God is holy. We need God to give us that understanding of who he is. There's a lot of different characteristics of God mentioned in the Bible. But I would challenge you to find another one that is emphasized three times on a regular basis. He is holy, holy, holy. You go to the book of Revelation, the same seraphim are still saying it, and it says they're going to say it. They're going to keep saying it. He's holy, 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 covering their feet, covering... They're just, they got two wings flying, but four of them are covering up almost their createdness. He's just so holy, this God. We need that personally. Lord, give me, open my eyes. Let me see you for who you are. Isaiah had a revelation, didn't he? I think he wants to give all of us that revelation. That he is a holy God. And when Isaiah got that revelation, what else did it cause? Verse 5. Woe is me, for I am undone. I am going to be cut off. I'm going to be destroyed because I am a man of unclean lips. I am a sinner. How did he get this revelation? Because God is holy. We need to see God for who he is. He's a holy, holy, holy God. What does it mean to be holy? Really clearly put, holy means to be separate. He's separate. Holy is very similar to being, he's sanctified. What does that mean? He's set apart. He's separate. What is he separate from? In him is light. God is light. And in him there is no darkness. He is set apart from darkness. And it says you and I can walk in darkness. What is that talking about? Walking in sin. He's set apart from sin. He is holy. And where does that leave you and I? Woe is me. I'm a sinner. There's a separation. He's holy. Number one, we need to know that God is holy. Second thing, Psalm 89, I'm going to read one verse here. Verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. I like that. Our God, he's sitting on his throne, and his whole train was filling the temple. Remember, Uzziah had that revelation? He's sitting on his throne, and what does it say? Righteousness and justice are the foundation. He is righteous. What is right? He is right. He is righteousness. This is how we know what is right and what is wrong. We look to him. He is the standard of perfection. He is perfect and he is righteous. And his throne isn't just some arbitrary thing in how he decides what's right and what's wrong. He is righteous. Every judgment he gives is perfectly correct and true. And it is just. Every consequence is just. God hates partiality. In James 1, it talks about that for us. He doesn't want us to be partial. Why? Because he's not partial. He wants us to have justice within us. How do we know what is right and what is wrong? How do we have this inner sense of morality? It all comes because we're created in his image. He has a plan for us to know what is right and what is wrong. He wants to speak to us. He wants us to show us. He doesn't want us to have to look somewhere else out there. He wants to speak right into each of our hearts that we might know. Even though all my friends are doing it, it doesn't make it right. What is the Holy Spirit speaking into your heart? 
He convicts us. He judges us sometimes. That's wrong. I'm convicting you. Don't do it, my son. Don't do it, my daughter. He's completely just. And ultimately, his eternal judgment is going to be very 100% just. God is holy and he is just. And it says the wages of sin is death. And that death is what? Well, it starts in our members. We can see that my body is aging. It's getting older and death, natural death is approaching. But it's not just natural death. It's eternal death. Separation from God. It started with Adam and Eve right away. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. They didn't die naturally that day. What happened? Spiritual death. Separation from God. Because God is holy. It brought separation. So there's, second thing was that he's just. So he's holy and he's just. Third thing we need to know is that God is love. And we cannot understand love apart from his holiness. If you try to understand what love looks like apart from the holiness of God, you will get a twisted idea of love. The world talks all about love, and it's very twisted, and it's not accurate. <clears throat> we need to understand what love really is. And we know that God is not against people. As a matter of fact, he desires not a single person to perish but that all would come to repentance, it says. But I'm going to go to a very common passage, John 3. Many of us could quote it. Three, I'm starting in verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life do you see he's not a monstrous god he's a holy god and he's completely just and he sees your state and my state totally separate from him and what did he do the consequence is eternal separation from me so what do i have to do he said like, i'll give my one and only perfect without spot without blemish son the lamb of god so that andrew so that put your name there could be reconciled back to god no longer have to be separate but rather we can be one with him that's the love of god he doesn't just say, it doesn't matter, love whoever you like, love whatever you like, do whatever. No. Love is, I see your state, my son, my daughter, the one I created for a purpose, totally separate from me. Why? Because in my love, I gave you a free choice. It started in the garden, and they chose to live for themselves, and they got separated from me. There's only one way to be able to be one with him again. And that's through having the consequence of our sin paid by Jesus Christ. This is love. He's not a monstrous God. He's the most loving God there is. He sent his son to die for me, to pay the just consequence of my sin. A monstrous God. He's so full of love. But we need to understand he's holy. He's a holy God. There's a lot of verses we could talk about here, but I'm going to read one here in Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, 25. I'm going to start in verse 22. It says, by Hebrews 7, 22, it says, by so much more Jesus has become surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing in the priesthood, right, under the old covenant. But Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, 
since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as the other priests under the old covenant, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. That's the son of God. That's the one who's our high priest, separate from sinners, and yet he came and paid the ultimate sacrifice so he could save us to the uttermost, so that we could be reconciled back to God. I'm going to read in Romans 5 as well. 5 verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward Andrew, toward you, in that while you were in your worst state, he saw me when I was practicing all those secret sins. He saw it all. And he thought, I'll send my son. I'll send Jesus to make a way for him to be set free from his sin, to no longer have to face the eternal wrath that I deserved. That's what he did for me. Right? Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Such good news. I'm going to read two more passages. One's in Isaiah. Well, we'll see. Maybe three. One's in, uh, two. One's in Isaiah, chapter 53. Some people are very familiar with this chapter. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to go to verse 5. It says, Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastment for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in, in his hand. And he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, by righteousness. But my righteous servant shall be justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." What, what great hope we have. Jesus came. He came to pay the price of our sin. Why? Because without it, we'd be set apart, separate from God for eternity. I'll finish here in 1 John 4. Nine and ten, it says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. But we are yet sinners, right? He did this. And so God is not a monstrous God that some people would like to make him out to be because there will be an eternal, everlasting judgment where the worm won't die but the fire keeps burning, the torment lasts forever. That doesn't mean he's a monstrous God, but rather it's because he's a holy and just God. And yet in the midst of those two truths, he's also an extremely loving God, demonstrated that he sent his son. He's a holy God. And I think we should consider saying, God, give us a greater revelation of, of your holiness. Let us see you for who you are. You're separate from sinners. Because once we get that, and as that revelation would increase, I think we're going to get the same revelation Isaiah had. Woe is me. Lord, who am I? I'm in, I'm in trouble. I am a sinner. It's a holy God. And God is just. He's not unjust that he condemns the wicked, but he's just. 
But the good news is he sent his son to take our place. Are you putting your faith 100% in what Jesus has done? Who has bewitched you, it says to the Galatians? Who has tricked you? How did you receive the spirit? Was it through the works? Was it through getting circumcised? Was it going through giving enough money, sitting in church every Sunday? Is that how we get the spirit? What does it say? Through faith. Are you 100% by faith trusting in what Jesus has done for you? Do you have a revelation that we need to run to him and put our faith in him? He's our hope. I was reading about Lazarus and the rich men. Is that a parable or is that a true story? No other parable does he use a name. I can't say for sure, but I know what he was sharing there was true. And you know, the rich man, when he was in this eternal torment, he wasn't saying, God, this isn't just. He doesn't say that. He wasn't saying, God, this is too long. It's not justified. No, it doesn't say that. What does he say? Send someone to tell my brothers because then they'll repent. He knew the problem. He had perfect understanding. I didn't repent. I want them to repent. That's what he said. Someone to tell my brothers. Otherwise, they're going to end up here in this place of torment with me. He says, I should have repented. He had the revelation. He knew what he didn't do. And so I guess I put that before us. Have we repented? And are we fully trusting in Jesus? And then are we repenting when the Lord convicts us of those little things? Are we continuing to repent? It's just a one-time thing, but boy, we need to acknowledge our shortcomings and continue to look to him on a daily basis all the way in to eternity. That would be my challenge this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a holy God. And Lord, I ask that you, out of your mercy, might give each one of us a greater revelation of what that looks like and who you are, your holiness. And Lord, I thank you that you are completely just. And Lord, that the foundations of your throne is justice. Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you, Lord, most of all, that you sent your one and only son, that you didn't just leave us in a in a condemned state, but Lord, you made a way that we could be reconciled back to you. I thank you for that. I thank you that you are loving. And I ask that you would speak to each one of us, Lord, myself included, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts, as Tim was sharing, Lord, that we wouldn't let anything else, even lawful things, get in the way of us pursuing you wholeheartedly, Lord, that we wouldn't get distracted, our eyes wouldn't get off the prize. Lord, I ask that we would be burdened about seeing your kingdom advance in our own hearts and our families and in those around us. Lord, that the things of earth would truly be growing strangely dim. Lord, that we wouldn't be consumed with natural things, but we'd be consumed with spiritual things. Work in our lives, I pray. I thank you that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen.